Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jawahar al Hagbani. I am a research assistant uh, and a member of the Applied Linguistic Research Lab at, Prince, at the College of Humanity, Prince Sultan University. Alongside with two of my colleagues, Dr. Muna Salim from the Translation Department, as well as Ms. Maram al Khdair from the Applied Linguistics Department. We will be running the room, inshallah, for today. On the behalf, at the beginning, on the behalf of the Applied Linguistics Research Lab at the College of Humanity, Prince Sultan University, we would like to welcome you all to the first international symposium on applied linguistics research. Before we start our session for today, I would like to highlight that at the, there is a time for question and answer at the end of the session. If you have any question during the session, please write it in the Q&A because there is where we're gonna look at the question. Also, if you have any thought, comment, and impression about the session, please share it on Twitter using the hashtag PSUALR2020. For the first session, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Sayyida Rabia Tahir and Dr. Noor Aini Ma'roof. Dr. Saadiya, Dr. Sayyida Rabia Tahir will present from Asia E University, Malaysia. She will talk about the stakeholders' attitude and belief toward the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies subject. Dr. Saadiya Rabia Tahir, the floor is yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the blessings of God be upon you. A very good morning to everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair, for introducing me. I would like to thank all the virtual audience attending this conference from all over the world with whom I'm very excited to share my paper presentation. This paper is about the stakeholders' attitudes and beliefs towards the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject. Let us look at the outline of this presentation. I will start off with giving you a brief background of the study, moving towards the purpose, literature review, and the statement of the problem. This is followed by the methodology and results. I will end my presentation with a short conclusion. I hope to keep your attendance moving for forward. The paper is written in the context of Malaysia. So let me give you a little background of the research. Islamic studies in Malaysia. The religion of Islam is widely practiced in Malaysia as a large part of the population is Muslim. Bahasa Malaysia is the national language of Malaysia, while English is the second most used language. Arabic language, which is the language of the sources of Islamic education, becomes an additional language. Secondly, in private and international Islamic schools, it is a common practice to use at least two of these languages for teaching and learning of Islamic study subject. Lastly, research shows that investigating the attitudes and beliefs towards the subject, object, or the phenomena in position proves in, to be significant in its evaluation and support. Which takes us to the purpose of our study. We wanted to investigate the nature of attitudes and beliefs towards the uh, of the stakeholders towards the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject to answer a research question as to what is the nature of their attitudes and belief? Are they positive or negative? Let me define the operational definition for the stakeholders here. They are the particular school's principal, the teachers of Islamic study subject, students of Islamic study subject, and parents. We, re we review the literature for three key elements, Islamic studies in Malaysia. Al-Ghazali and Al-Atlas are the two prominent figures in describing Islamic education and curriculum. Islamic studies is summed up to form the education of the Holy Quran, its reading, recitation, memorization, the word of the and action of the Holy Prophet, that's the Hadith, jurisprudence, creed, theology, Sufism, history, the science of Arabic language, logic, and philosophy. In short, Islamic studies is the subject that teaches a Muslim the complete code of life, while Arabic is the religious language. Bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies. Baker states that bilingual education is a simplistic label for a complex phenomena. This paper resonates with the concept where bilingual education is where two languages are used and promoted. Dr. Paliha says that the language of instruction in Malaysia are Bahasa Malaysia, Malay language, English, Mandarin, Tamil. Bahasa Malaysia is the national and official language, English, which is the second most language. 
second most used language. Attitudes and belief. Hayes provides definitions for attitudes and belief. Attitudes are affective uh, outcomes like our anger, disgust, elation, and beliefs are referred to the both facts and strong convictions we hold. I came across a roadblock. The first problem was that not all students have Arabic language proficiency. It is the language of the religion, but Muslims living all around the globe hold strong affiliations to their national language, even here in Malaysia. Secondly, there is a common understanding with human behavior supported by research that attitudes and beliefs of the stakeholders need to be positive towards bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject in order to facilitate effective teaching and learning of the subject. Let's look at the methodology that we use. The research was conducted at a private international Islamic schools in Malaysia, which uses Bahasa Malaysia, English language, and Arabic language as a language for teaching and learning of Islamic study subject. A survey was conducted in both English and Arabic. Each stakeholder survey comprised of the demographical data and a five point liquor scale was used to evaluate attitudes and beliefs separately towards the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject that ranged from strongly agree, agree to strongly disagree. Secondly, audio video interview protocol was conducted. Data analysis was done using SPSS and the interviews was transcribed, coded and thematically analyzed. Member consent and checking, Chromebox Alpha and inter-rater reliability confirm the research reliability and validity. So let's look at the results of the survey. The survey results show us that all stakeholders have more positive beliefs and attitude percentages than negative. This results show us that all stakeholders have positive attitudes and beliefs towards the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies subject. We can clearly see that the school principal, the teacher of Islamic studies, students, parents, each stakeholder has a very, as more than 50% uh, positive belief and positive uh, attitude. These are the percentage of response on the five point liquor scale items. Okay, let's look at the second result, which was of the audio video interview protocol. So after the verbatim transcription, we made codes and themes. And all this, these themes, are uh, we made sure we get the insight to the attitudes and beliefs of the stakeholders. I would like to share the detail with you moving further. Here we have the bar chart of average or the mean of attitude scale data and belief scale data of the school principal and the teachers of the Islamic study subject. We can see that all the average output for attitudes and belief scale were more than three out of a five point liquor scale, which shows once again the positive attitudes and belief of the school principal and the teacher of Islamic studies. So just look at the principal survey average attitude, a total item of 20, the sum was 96 and the average were 4.8 which is a very uh, nice and good average out of a five point liquor scale. And look at the teacher survey attitude beliefs bar chart. It shows that the average was 4.09, which is a very high average and shows a positive result. Here we have the bar chart of average or mean, mean of attitudes data and belief scale data of the students of Islamic studies subject and parents. We see that the, all the average output for attitudes and belief scale were more than three out of a five point Likas scale, which shows once again, the positive attitudes and belief of the school prints of the students and parents. Moving further, let's look at each stakeholders result. So the first stakeholder is the principal. Let's look at one example of the liquor scale item for attitudes. I am happy that the online lessons for Islamic study subject are in both Arabic and English language. The principal strongly agrees to it, which is five, five, uh, five point out of five point like a scale. And let's look also look at one of the belief scale item. Teachers can successfully teach Islamic studies when taught in both Arabic and English. The principal also strongly agrees to this. 
both show that the principal of the school has a positive attitude and belief towards the bilingual pedagogy as he strongly agrees with the item. School's principal result of the thematic analysis. Okay, so I made a bar, uh, I made a form. We, we can see the theme and the verbatim transcription and we analyzed it to find the result. So let's look, look at one theme that relates to the attitude of the principal, language. The principal says, for my teachers, I hope they can use Arabic and English and even Bahasa for our students. So his overall attitude is positive towards the use of more than one language for the Islamic study subject. And if we look at the belief through the current practice of the theme of the current practice, we can see that we use, the principal says, we use three language to make our student more confident. So the principal has a positive belief regarding the use of more than one language for teaching and learning of Islamic studies subject and people's beliefs strongly affect their behavior. Moving forward, let's look at the second stakeholder results that are the teachers of Islamic studies subject. We can see the, uh, the reliability statistics that Chromebooks Alpha was very good. And let's look at one item of the attitude liquor scale. So, First one, I am happy that the online lessons I teach for the Islamic study subject, we are in both Arabic and English, which has a 53.40 percentage. So it shows a positive, 50, more than 50% uh, we consider a positive response towards the use of language, two languages for Islamic study subject. Look at the belief scale. Okay, let's Take it the last one. I think parents who do not know Arabic and English face problems with helping their children in learning Islamic study subject. And 80% of teachers believe it to be true. So both show that the teachers of the school has a positive attitude and belief towards bilingual pedagogy as they strongly agree with the items. Let's look at the teacher's results of the thematic analysis. Again, let's look at the theme of language, where first teacher says, if most of them don't understand what I'm trying to say, then I will mix two languages. So it does show that the teachers do use, they do uh, uh, initiate, they do suggest, they do like the uh, use of two languages to teach Islamic studies subject. And the, it forms a culminative attitude of the teacher that it's the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies should be practiced. Okay, even for the belief like current practices, the theme of current practices, we can see the teacher says, I asked them to sing a song and these are vocabs. I teach them to sing the song and, and the teacher said uh, to in the interview protocol called clearly, clearly that they use songs in English and Arabic so that the, the students can retain information which is also a current practice for bilingual pedagogy. Moving forward, let's look at the results of the students, the third stakeholder, the students of Islamic study subject. Again, we did the Chromebook Alpha and the reliability was very good, uh, even better than good, 0 0.9, 0 0.4. I am very happy in the attitudes item. Let's look at item, attitude item. And, and it says, I am happy when the teacher teaches Islamic studies using Arabic and English. So the students feel his attitude is positive as it's a 66.8% positive response. While the belief, I answer my teacher's question in Islamic studies class in both English and Arabic. So the students think that they are happy, they are confident. They also think that they know that if they can answer uh, the teacher's question in using two languages in Islamic studies class which shows that students are also positive uh, in their attitudes and beliefs regarding bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject. These are simple histogram of uh, showing a normal curve of the mean data and standard deviation. Okay, so principal and teacher's thematic analysis reveals about students' attitude and beliefs. What the theme were students. So what the principal's verbatim transcription says, it says the expert student in English 
and there's an expert student's Arabic. And then we can teach them what language they can understand. So they know the principal knows that in a class, there's a student who can understand English better and who, and there's another student in the class who knows Arabic better. So what they do, the teacher makes sure that, obviously the teacher makes sure that the instruction in, is in such a language or two languages, both students can understand. So the results, and for the teacher's verbatim transcription, the teacher say, it depends on the students. Yes, if the student is smart enough to understand, but the teacher also said the student can increase their confidence to learn language. And mostly students are Malay. So majority of students are Malay. Naturally, there's L1 is not Arabic. The results support students' high mean for the attitudes and belief items, which was positive. Look at the results of parents, which is the stakeholder number four. I have a bar chart of a one item of the attitude. Say, I am pleased that online assessment of Islamic study subject is done in both Arabic and English. And most of the parents agree to it. And also looking at a sample parents belief item. It says, I am convinced that Islamic studies course books and handouts are in Arabic and English. So when the course book and handouts are also in Arabic and English, meaning they're in two languages, it supports bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject and parents agree to it. So it is happening, it's there. And this is a simple um, histogram showing a normal curve for the mean and student deviation. Principal's attitude, principal and teacher's thematic analysis revealed about parents' attitudes. So because we did the pair, uh, principal and teacher's interview protocol, we used the theme of parents and students to describe their attitude and belief and support the uh, survey data. So about parents, the principal says, we understand the parents have very problem that they have they have faced problems with Arabic homework. If we give the homework in only Arabic language, it's difficult for students to understand. It, it's even difficult for the parents to help their children. So the, the principal understands this. And teachers say, the parents contact me on how to do this homework. And I ask the students to sing the song. So the teacher are actually using techniques, bilingual pedagogy techniques, so that the parents can also be helped and their attitude becomes uh, positive towards bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies subject. So as we res the result shows that most parents, L1 is not Arabic and they find difficulties in the homework. They have positive attitude and belief when it comes to the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic studies subject as showed by their high average attitude and belief of the item responses in the survey. This paper concludes that overall nature of the stakeholders' attitudes and belief is positive towards the bilingual pedagogy of Islamic study subject. It resonates with the usefulness of attitudes and belief research in education to address and support language policies and practice in support of bilingual education. It is safe to conclude that the paper coincides with the conference theme of language studies, practical implications for the society. In the end, I would like to thank the audience for their patience and attention. Uh, sorry for all the blunders if I did so. I would also thank my mentor and second author for this paper, Dr. Noraini Maruf, for her dedication and guidance throughout the research process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sayeda Rabia Tahir for your informative talk. Thank you so much. And here we are opening the floor for the audience. If they have any question, they can write it in the Q&A. We have one question by Iman Ahmed. She is asking, from your experience, Dr. Sayeda, when I complete in the Master in Applied Linguistic, how can I improve myself? Okay, thank you much, very much for the question. I, I'm really happy that you did ask, uh, ask me a question. But uh, is the question is when I complete in the master's, I completed, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, she's asking Iman that when she completed the, in the master in applied linguistic, how can she improve herself? 
Okay, so she wants your advice. <laughs> Iman, a uh, mashallah, nice name. Okay, so Iman, when you've done your master's in applied linguistic, for if I want to suggest you, I I would rather suggest you to do pursue further studies. Do uh, if it's your interest, if you want to do, if it's your dedication there, do go for a PhD. Do go for research in applied linguistics, and that would surely help you improve yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saida Rabia Tahir and Dr. Nuraini Maruf for your research and your informative speech. Thank you so much. For now, we would like to welcome who, those who just joined us and remind you that uh, there will be time at the end of the session for your questions. If you have any question through the session, please write it in the Q&A because there is where we're going to look for the question. Also, if you have thoughts, comments about the session, please share it on Twitter using the hashtag PSUALR2020. For, not, for now, we would like to welcome our second speaker for the second session, Dr. Lama al rumehi from Prince, Princess Noura bint Abdurrahman University, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Lama will present a paper, the integration of CAT tools in Saudi University toward a more visible state. Dr. Lama, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lama Rumeh, and I'm here today with you to uh, present a study that I've conducted on computer-aided uh, translation tools, or CAT tools in short. It's about the integration of CAT tools in Saudi universities towards a more visible state. So here are the points I'll be covering. Um, so as we all know, technology has made a few changes in the world, and it becomes an important part of people's life. With the widespread of technology and the availability of computers, people started communicating with each other more than ever. Uh, so consequently, the demand for translation increased. Why? To overcome the language barriers. Therefore, the language services sector was urged, particularly the translation sector, to develop processes to increase productivity and software that can produce high quality translation to lower the costs. Um, with the expansion of technology, so many inventions uh, entered the translation market. Some of these inventions were uh, machine translation, CAT tools, translation management systems, et cetera, et cetera. With their entry uh, in the translation industry, they caused fear among human translators that will be replaced by, by these tools. But first, let, let us know what are CAT tools or what are they used for? Uh, European Association Machine Translation defines CAT tools as translation software packages which are designed primarily as an aid for human translator in the production of translations. Also, Boker uh, in 2002 defined them in a broader sense as CAT technology can be understood to include any type of computerized tool that translators use to help them do their job. So both definitions indicate that these tools are as an aid, are aid for human translators and not replacements. However, they're still afraid of them. And the only way to let them perceive these tools as an aid is by exposing them to these tools and um, let them use these tools in translation process. And Senway 2010 argues that the best way or the best places are the academic institutions. Um, so they are possibly the best places to acquire knowledge and skills of computer-aided translation. Uh, why? Because the opportunity that they offer to combine in-depth study with a practical experience, or as he said, projects in a real life setting. So with the entry of CAT tools, they shifted the notion of machine translation. So they aim to be an aid for human translators and not a replacement. And this is what brought me to this study. Uh, the shift that they made in the translation industry and the fact that so many universities around the world um, started integrating them into their translator training programs, especially uh, including, sorry, Saudi universities. However, there were some evidence that aroused the question about the efficiency of this integration. And some of them want Samson's mentioned that um, many 
companies in the translation industry complain about the translator's efficiency, including the new graduates and using CAF tools. Also, what Dr. Alatib in her study stated that the participants in her study, who happen to be uh, students, translation students, have never been acquainted with CAF tools, and they were advised to avoid using technology in translation except for some electronic dictionaries. Also, what Fatani indicated that there is a negligence of translation industry by the governmental institutions in Saudi Arabia, and that negligence is due to the lack of qualified translators in different levels, including the technical control. On the top of that, most of the uh, studies in the previous uh, or in the, uh, the previous studies in the literature. Um, especially the ones conducted on Saudi universities, have never um, uh, focused or investigated the state of CAP tools integration in Saudi universities or their usage by the uh, translation students and graduates. However, they investigated other issues within the same context. For example, the attitude towards these tools, the evaluation of these tools, and, and so forth. And also, most of them conducted on one university or focused on one section, whether the male or female section. As in Saudi universities, we have uh, two sections, uh, the male section and female section. So to bridge that gap, this study aims to explore the state of CAF tools in some Saudi universities. It includes three universities uh, in Saudi Arabia, which are uh, King Saudi University, Imam Muhammad ibn Saud Islamic University, and Princess Noor University, and both sections, the male and female section. Also, uh, it aims to investigate the extent to which the students and graduates of these universities use CAP tools and different translation tasks and courses and not only being familiar with these tools, because being familiar with CAP tools does not mean that they are able to use them in the translation process. Furthermore, the study uh, aims to highlight the benefits of CAP tools and the importance of integrating them into the translator training programs. Uh, it asks two main questions. Uh, the first one, what is the current state of CAT tools integration into the translator training programs in Saudi universities? And the second one, to what extent do translation students and graduates of Saudi universities use CAT tools and different translation tasks and courses? Why this study is significant? Because it aspires to contribute to the field of translation, especially the translation technology, as I mentioned. It tackles a topic that has, uh, hasn't been discussed mainly in the previous study, especially the one conducted on Saudi universities. Also, it could be beneficial to raise the awareness of the decision makers and curriculum developers to consider the state of CAP tools in the translator training programs or to motivate them to make some changes to the translation curricula in their universities in a way that they address the market needs more and the technological developments in the field. Um, also, it could be beneficial to shed some light on the act of disseminating the importance of CAP tools, not only among the translation students, but also among the teaching staff, the translation teaching staff as they play a very important role in this process. So the methodology used in this study, the study adopts a mixed methods approach, convergent design. Uh, the uh, mixed methods approach combines qualitative and quantitative approach. And uh, it, it makes the research problems more understandable. And the convergent design allows for triangulation of the data. So meaning that the data were, uh, were uh, collected from different sources and the sources used in this study were the study plans of the translator training programs of the three universities, an electronic survey and a semi-structured interview that followed the survey. Uh, I'll talk about them briefly. The study plans uh, of the translator training programs are document that include the plan of the entire program and give an overview of the courses in the program. And some of them attach course specifications, which are also documents, but they, are, they have detailed information about each uh, course. Those course specifications were the one collected and analyzed in this study. And only the courses related to CAT tools were focused on because they are of a concern to this study. As for the electronic survey, it was directed to Arabic English translation students and graduates in the uh, three universities who graduated in the year uh, during the year of 2017, 2019, or expected to graduate in the next two years. Also, those who graduated a year, just a year before and after the determined period were also included in this study to track the development of the CAT tools integration and to see their impacts on the students and graduates. The survey uh, was designed to assess four constructs. I'll be talking about them in details in the results. 
Um, as for the same structured interview, it followed the survey, so it was designed to obtain an in-depth insights into the participants' general experience with capitalism. So the data analysis, also the data were analyzed using different methods. The qualitative data were analyzed using content analysis method. This method is all about coding the data and assigning themes for these codes. As for the quantitative data, they were analyzed using statistical methods. Now the results. I'll start with the study plans results. All of the universities provided um, one course in capitals, except Imam Muhammad bin Saud Islamic University. Instead, it provided a course in computer-aided language learning, COL. Some of the analyzed translation courses and graduation courses slightly integrate the CAT tools, and some just mentioned them as an option for the students. Also, the study plans, the courses in the study plans aim to achieve almost the same objectives. They have the same teaching method and assessment. As for the results, it was designed to assess four constructs. The first one was the participant's profile. In this construct, the participants were categorized based on their gender, university, a number of CAT tools they took at the university, computer skills, and so forth. But before that, the total number of the participants, first it was 340, and then it went down to 318 uh, after the exclusion of their relevant uh, responses. Uh, as not all of the universities included in this study uh, have a male section, so the number or the um, female participants outnumbered the male participants as the male constitute 80% of the total participants, while the female constitute 92%. Almost half of the participants were graduates, while more than half of them were students. Also, the majority rated themselves as good users of the computers and some as excellent users. Also, the majority of the graduate um, uh, respondents work as translators. This question was directed to graduates only. However, the students' participants showed some interesting uh, results, as more than half of them use, uh, um, work as part-time translators. As for the number of CAT courses they took at the university, the majority uh, reported that they took only one course in the university. The second construct was about the familiarity with CAT tools. Here they were asked about how did they first become familiar with CAT tools and what was the source of their familiarity. As you can see, the majority of the participants were to some extent familiar with CAT tools and only 12% weren't familiar. As for the, th the source of their familiarity, university courses were the primary source for them. The third construct was about the usage of CAT tools. Here they were asked about the usage of CAT tools in translation tasks, and almost half of them do not use CAT tools in a translation in their translation tasks. As for those who use them, the majority use them occasionally, some use them frequently, few use them but rarely. Moving on to the last and uh, the fourth and the last construct in the, sur in the survey, uh, which was about computer uh, CAT tools uh, courses in the universities and the participants' opinions. Here, they were asked about their usage of CAT tools across translation courses in the university. So, um, as you can see, um, more than half of them do not use CAT tools across translation courses. However, their usage uh, was restricted to CAT courses only. As for their instructor's encouragement of the use of CAT tools in, their, in the, the courses they teach or across translation courses, as you can see, in all of the universities, the highest bars are the ones uh, representing the no answer, which means uh, they weren't encouraged to use CAT tools. Uh, continuing on the same construct, most of the participants indicated that the, the universities did not provide them with workshops related to uh, translation technology or CAT tools. Um, also, 59% reported that the labs in their universities weren't equipped with the necessary items. As for the results of the semi-structured interview, it was analyzed using content analysis methods. So three themes emerged from the analysis. The first one was about the views on capital's experience. Here, the participants showed um, uh, or highlighted their cha the challenges, limitations, and developed some sort of disappointment towards the course in general which course, the course they took at the university, even though here they were asked about their general experience. But the first thing that came up to their minds, most if not all of them, was the course they took at the university. They started by describing the course, then they talked about their general experience. So they described the course as limited, basic, um, and some of them said the university does not provide the course. 
Uh, also, they developed some sort of resentment regarding the availability of the license. Uh, they, they didn't uh, use the, um, the tool, but they used the uh, trial version of that tool or the, the software in the course they were introduced to in the, in the course. Uh, so the, the majority of them used the trial version and some of them accessed the trial from their instructor's laptop. Some mentioned some differences regarding the license of the uh, software between the male and female section. And when they were asked about their uh, instructors, uh, the ones in charge uh, of teaching the CAT courses, whether they are informed of the course materials and have knowledge about technology, they showed different experience. Some said yes, some said no, some said they were informed to some extent. The second theme was about opinions about CAT courses. Here they developed a negative attitude towards the course. Here they were asked about the course they took at the university and whether it was enough uh, to prepare them to enter the job market. Uh, the majority said no, it wasn't enough. Some said it could be with some adjustment. Also, they showed a high level of awareness of CAT tools importance in the job market. When they were asked about which translator will get more opportunities in the job market, a translator with CAT tools experience or a translator without, the majority chose the one with and they justified their answers. And when they were asked about the uh, best way to motivate them to use these tools more in the translation, they focused on three aspects. The first one, the availability of the license. At the second one, the role of the teaching staff, they highlighted the role of the teaching staff. Also, they um, asked for more practical exposure to the tools. The last theme was about the suggestions for a uh, future curriculum. Here, the participants were given the a chance to give elaborative suggestions about what they wanted to be included in their university's curriculum. Uh, most of their suggestions focused on three aspects also. Uh, they asked for more technology involvement and more integration of CAP courses. Also, they asked for more preparation for them to enter the job market. Uh, furthermore, they asked for more maintenance and equipment for the labs. All of the studies that I uh, just presented uh, before you were triangulated in this study and um, to, to ensure the validity and reliability of this study. So to be able to answer the first two questions that asked about the CAT tools uh, integration, the state of CAT tools integration in the three universities, uh, the results show that CAT tools are not integrated effectively into the translator training programs because the study plans, the, the documents show that not all of them provide CAT courses and the universities that do, they lack some elements that hinder the efficacy of this integration as their study plans um, show that they provide only one course and the number of courses was among the main aspects that the participants showed the resentment about. They describe it as limited, basic and not enough to prepare them uh, to enter the job market. And this can be correlated with Carly's statement when he stated that providing only a course on technology cannot guarantee the student's acquisition of the technical competence needed in the professional settings. Also, most of the uh, universities rarely provide the, uh, the students with uh, workshops related to CAT tools or uh, translation technology. Uh, furthermore, the infrastructure um, of the labs and almost all of the universities seem to be not fulfilling the course requirements. And these both uh, were indicated to be uh, potential factors of the lack of integrating CAT tools uh, in the universities. And also they indicate uh, a need to um, provide the students with more technology in an environment that supports the use of this technology. Well, to be able to answer the second main question in this, in, in this study that asked about the, um, uh, the extent to which the students and graduates of these universities use CAT tools in different translation tasks and courses, the results reveal that 45%, almost half of the participants do not use CAT tools across translation courses, while more than half of them do not use CAT tools across, uh, across translation courses, but almost half of them do not use them in their translation tasks. Um, the lack of, of CAT tools usage was um, highlighted and discussed in the previous studies as these studies suggested more integration and more usage of these tools. Also, the participants are prepared to be professional translators and not using CAT tools contradicts the findings of Lakidaki study. In that study, the participants who happen to be professional translators, they reported using more than one tool. 
also the results can justify the Samson's and uh, statement and Petani's indication I mentioned in the uh, beginning. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned that the uh, teaching staff plays an important role in this process. Their, their encouragement, the instructor's encouragement and the usage of, uh, of the students of CAT tools across translation courses were correlated in this study and the results show strong positive correlation with a high p-value, which indicates that the less the instructor's encouragement, the lack of the student's usage of these tools across translation courses. Or the usage can be uh, the lack of usage can be related to other factors such as the, uh, the unfamiliarity of uh, the teaching staff, the other teaching staff with CAT tools, or the lack of knowledge sharing. Uh, it, it is a concept basically about uh, sharing knowledge. So the, um, the, uh, the teaching staff do not share knowledge about their courses with each other, or it could be due to the lack of the design of the course. As the chef in her study uh, drew a correlation between the design of the course and the preparation of the translation student. Um, or it could be to do, due to the license as the participants reflected on in the um, interview, which can be related to the lack of university's fund as uh, confirmed by Yahoo's another TV study. So in conclusion, uh, let me remind you what, what this study is about. The study um, is about the, uh, it investigates the use uh, of CAT tools or the state of CAT tools integration in three universities in Saudi Arabia and both sections, the, 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 uh, the male and female section, and the usage of these tools by the uh, students and graduates of these universities. So the study proves that the state of CAT tools integration in these universities is still in its initial stages and needs more consideration. Also, it reveals a lack of CAT tools usage by the translation students and graduates in these universities in both the translation tasks and across translation courses. Furthermore, the study highlights that the participants are aware of the benefits of CAT tools for them and for their future career. In the end, the rapid technological development necessitate that the future translators or the translators in the market to acquire technical knowledge and be conversant with these tools and be able to use them in the translation process to save them a place in the future market, uh, in the future uh, job market. Or otherwise, they will be replaced, but not by the tools, but by translators who possess knowledge about these tools. Thank you for your time and attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Yama, for your informative and enlightening talk. Um, and please, if you have any question, write it in the Q&A. I would like to ask you, Dr. Nama, uh, what is your advice on CAT tools app apps for teachers and students? To be used by teachers or students? Both. But what's your advice for a teacher and what's your advice for students? So my advice for the teachers and for also the curriculum developers to look to the um, to consider the market needs to see what are the uh, the tools uh, asked or required more in the uh, job market and include them in the uh, program, the translator training programs. So both the um, the uh, teaching staff and also the students will be updated with the market needs. So by the time they, the students graduate, um, they will be able to perform uh, professionally in the uh, job market. Also, I advise the universities to provide the students and the teaching staff with uh, workshops related to these tools to, to both be informed with them. Is that what you need? Or you ask for names for programs? Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question for you. Your study was conducted on three universities. Based on what you chose these three universities? Sorry? Your study has been conducted on three universities. Yeah. Based on what you chose these three universities? Yes, based on um, and criteria. They adhere to the uh, studies criteria. Uh, the first one is they provide uh, co uh, translation courses. Uh, regardless of the title of the uh, of program. Also, they supply the market with certified translators and interpreters. 
And the third one was their location. Uh, I'm, uh, I live in Riyadh and also they are in Riyadh. So this facilitates any um, uh, future uh, concerns if I want to con uh, contact with the uh, participants or the university officials. Uh, there is a question uh, in the chat box from the from Dr. Al Jume. She is asking. Uh, she missed the first four minutes of the lecture. She asking you if you please could specify if CAT tools uh, courses were introduced to undergrad or postgraduate students. Uh, undergraduate students. Okay. Also, there is another question. What are examples of the CAT tools being used in the three universities mentioned? Um, number of CAT tools, but the most, uh, the, the one that uh, all of the universities focus on, except Imam Muhammad bin Saud Islamic University, as the university does not provide the course, uh, KSU and PNU uh, used um, a number of pro uh, programs. However, they focus on SDL Tradas as they ask the students to run the uh, course project using this tool. And this tool is not, um, uh, it's not a cloud-based. And they, that's why they, they did not install it for the students. So they gave them an, um, a license, a three days uh, a trial. That's why the students weren't very happy with the, with the trial as the trial prevented them from exploring the tools. Okay. Also, there is another question. What sort of cat tools our students need? I can't hear you, sorry. Uh, what a sort of CAT tools our students need? As I said, uh, this is actually similar to the question you asked me. They need not to to be um, to give them only one tool. They need to choose the tool that fits them the most. And to do so, we need to um, give them a, a, a selection of a free source. Uh, programs and instead of just restricting their usage to only one tool that happens to be expensive and uh, this actually uh, also an advice by Boker she also advised to uh, or presented methods to motivate the students to use these tools more um, either by providing video tutorials for the students to be informed about these tools or to provide them as I, as I said a free selection or a selection of a free source programs let them explore the tools and then choose the one that fits them the most, not restricting the, their usage to only one tool or ask them to run the a project or a certain project by using a certain tool. Thank you so much, Dr. Lema, for your speech. Thank you so much. I would like to draw to withdraw our attendees' attention that our next session, inshallah, we will start after five minutes until the speaker join us. Thank you so much. See you after five minutes. For now, I would like to welcome who just joined us on the behalf of the Applied Linguistic Research Lab at the College of Humanity, Prince Sultan University to the first international symposium in applied linguistics. And I would like to remind you that at the end of the session, there is a time for question and answer. If you have any questions during the session, please write it in the Q&A because there is where there is where we're going to look at the questions. Also, if you have any thought, comments, impression about the session, please share it on Twitter using the hashtag PSUALR2020. Now I would like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Philip Botanga Anisa from University of Mines and Technology, Ghana. He will present about the improving English language learners diction using the schema reading theory through the reverse classroom strategy. Dr. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I could be heard so clearly there. Yes, we can hear you. Good, thank you. Um, good morning from Ghana, West Africa. And uh, the right pronunciation of my name is Philip Boateng Anta. Yes, good. So um, I'm so glad to be part of this conference. And I would like to share um, a research I made. It's, 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 let me put it on record that it's an ongoing project. By virtue of uh, COVID-19, um, the areas are earmarked to have this whole thing you know, conclusively done, I couldn't achieve it. And as we're going on, we're going to see that. I targeted four different areas, as in schools. Two, I was able to do it 
before the COVID broke up and then there was a lockdown. But other two was able to give a very clear picture, although I hope to complete it when everything goes down. Good. So I'm presenting on the topic, improving English language learners diction using the schema theory or reading theory through the reverse classroom strategy. Now we're going to have this discussion on the following um, subheadings. Have the intro, the research goals, the literature review, theory methods, data analysis, findings, conclusions, and then the, we just have a brief reference. So a brief background to um, the, the, the state of education in Ghana, West Africa. So um, Ghana was colonized by the British. So English happens to be um, our language, you know, our um, lingua franca, official language that we use in our schools. Now, several people have written on um, various approaches that could be used in helping people like our state, those who are learning the language as a second language, for that matter, not a, um, a first language or native speaker. So SUSA 2011, okay, says that um, the English learners, um, English language learners are a diverse group of people or students, okay, who are learning the English language, um, not as native as I already explained, and that it would, by that means, you know, improve their proficiency level. Now, Janssen also had something to do with that. I think we didn't waste much time on the, these ones, but they all, they all added their voices as to why we need to learn some of these things. Janssen, for one, said that um, if one is not a native speaker, you know, and learning a language as a second one, the person is faced with this problem of metaphor, uh, the state at which words are used and the context within which they are used. Because the person is not staying with the people, and they're just reading someone's language. At times, it's difficult to get the, the, the full or the real meaning of whatever he or she is reading about. As I mentioned earlier, um, English is our official language that we use in our schools. Okay, so that is the reason why uh, we need to have this kind of research. So it, it could be used to enhance the way we are able to acquire the language so well and then perform so well uh, in our academic pursuits. Let's have a brief look at uh, Ghana's education system and for which reason, you know, puts me into going to, uh, into this area of research. So uh, Ghana's education system um, has a six year elementary, okay, education plus three kg, making nine at the basic. And then you have the ex three extra years at the junior high level, after which you take your exam, that will qualify you to the senior high level. Then over day two, you have three years there. And then when you are successful, you progress to the tertiary. Now, um, the research is focused at the senior high level, the three year senior high level, of which I, I narrowed it down to the very first year class. The reasons will be given as you are moving on. So literature in English is one of the major subjects, you know, that are pursued uh, by students. You know, um, it, is, it is found in the arts at kind of um, class. So you study three years after which you will take your exam. Now, the exam that students write at the end of their three years is under the supervision of what we call the Y, West African Examinations Council. So after that, they examine how, how you are fed and then, you know, based on your results, whether you can progress or you have to do some research. Now, this examination body has their leader to be the chief examiner. At the end of every examination period or season, you know, he comes out with a report. And it's that report that influenced this sort of research in, in that it was clear. It came out that students, you know, have problems with the English language, okay? The literature aspect, you know, is in two folds. We have what we call the elective English, in other words, elective literature. And then we have the call English or core English language. Now with the core English language, you, we have an aspect of it that you have to do something with literature. So it has three areas, you know, composition, as in essay writing, we have summary, you have comprehension and all. And then we also have literature in English, but that one is on the lighter side, you know, they don't read that deep. 
but you are assessed at the end of it. But this very one focused on those who were doing literature as an elective subject. Okay, so these are some of the comments that were passed, you know, or were given in the chief examiner's report uh, 2018, the latest one that is there. Now it reads that the standard of the paper was not different from the previous one as the previous year, but candidates' performance appeared to have fallen slightly lower than that of the previous year. Now, um, there's this sub subheading, candidate weakness, and this one too was taken from the Bebei team. Either no knowledge or inadequate knowledge of the text. You know, students um, found this, themselves in that state where, you know, they, per their performance, it was clear. It, it showed that either they didn't have enough knowledge or they, what they had, I mean, they didn't read, even read the text at all. And then there's this other one that says that answers were based on broad learning. They didn't show any mastery of whatever they were writing about. And this one too was taken from the um, summary, um, the weakness level of the, um, the report that was given. Now, so that was 2018. 2017, it goes on this way. The performance of candidates was not encouraging. However, a few students have good responses. Okay, now uh, with the weakness, um, poor knowledge of text, mere narration of plot and unnecessarily long winding introduction, then poor control of language. So this one was the, as I said, um, at the weakness section of the chief examiner's report. Now the last one, as in the, 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 the chief examiner's report that was given on 2016, now, it says that um, candidate performance was below expectation. Some candidates misunderstood some of the questions and therefore provided extraneous materials and irrelevant answers. Candidates provided sketchy and scanty answers. So this was 2016's um, um, comment by the chief examiner of WAIC, West African Examination Council, the body that is responsible for conducting exams. Good, now what might be the possible causes for this? So a few people have um, shared their views, you know, after conducting research. So SAD 27 or 2007 opines that teaching and learning becomes ineffective when the number of students in the class is extremely large, of which it is a, a clear feature in that part of the world here. Our classes are most of the time, you know, having bigger classes. So then could there be a way it could be improved? We can't just look at it this way. Now, and that is what this research um, is, is trying to do, come up with ways that this problem could be mitigated. Mohammed 98 also says that um, for one to get the positive feedback, um, some things must not be seen as features in the classroom, okay? And what are some of the, of the things there? There mustn't be this uh, style of teaching that is so inappropriate. There shouldn't be inadequate. Um, teaching resources, and then the, the time or the duration given to the teaching and learning must be extended. And all we just bear witness to the fact that it can be possible that every course or subject could have enough time, you know, on the timetable. It therefore um, results to the efficiency or the, um, the way that the teacher or the lecturer is able to come up with ways and means by which you can maximize time and also add on. So then you'll be able to, you also be able to complete the syllabus as assigned. Okay, so that is that on uh, for this very one. And then, then came, what is the best way forward? you know, after reading through several theories and all, how can, could that be any help as a teacher? So two theories I identified that I said I would like to explore and see how it works. One, interactive schema theory, IST, and then the flip classroom instructional strategy. Now this very one, um, interactive schema theory, basically for, for the benefit of those who might not have gone this area, the interactive schema theory basically deals with um, the teacher trying to link whatever he or she is teaching to a previous knowledge that is possessed by the learners that the, the students already have, what they know already. You, the teacher, trying to link it to, to, to that 
kind of thing. So then you, the understanding will be easier and simpler. You know, if it so happened that it's, it's disjointed, um, students find it difficult to understand. Now the flip classroom theory, instructional strategy also has something to do with um, students uh, being engaged way after the official classroom time. So in this case, it could be the fact that they are close from work, as in they are close from school, they are home. You, the teacher or the, the lecturer, devise a way or a means by which you can get them engaged, get in touch with them. And um, it should be said here that this very strategy or theory um, relies more on technology, in the internet, the computer, the phones. Good. So then while they are home, you schedule time with them and then you're able to meet them um, while they are there to continue what you are doing in class. So le now let's go to the research goals. One, to determine the instructional value of uh, using the FCIS and then the IST together, you know, in teaching um, English language, I purposefully sampled the poetry aspect of English language as in the literature. And then two, to assess the perception of teachers and students in using the FCIS as an instructional approach. Okay, so four schools were initially sampled. Now, as I'm doing this presentation, I'm through or done with only two. Um, as I said, um, two were a less endowed school, you know, less endowed. What I mean by that is that they don't have some facilities. Okay. And then we, I also selected another, another two. They were, you know, endowed. How? By virtue of how they do so well, their old students are so vibrant. They have provided the school with so many things, internet and all. But I had wanted to finish with a less endowed one, then I come here, only for me to be caught on the way by the um, COVID. But by then I was through with the less endowed. That is the two schools, um, Priceo Senior High and Bepom Senior High, SHS, Senior High School. The sample students were 200, 100 per school. Sample population was the first year literature in English students, the 10th grade. The reason for this is that um, these students are students who have just come onto the, the um, SHS level so fresh, you know, from the junior high. So their minds are so fertile, they have just been introduced to what do you mean by electives and core, elective subjects, the majors and the minors. And then it was done in the second semester because by first semester they had been taken through some um, basics in the course. If you take literature, literature in English, for, for example, you know, you need to have some ideas about the literary terms, the figures of speech and all that. So they had done that in the first semester. So this research was done in their second semester. Data collection tools. So we, um, I used the observation and then an informal interview for my pre-intervention stage. What, what does this mean then? As we move on, we just, we go over all that. Now the post-intervention, we used questionnaire. So the procedure. So I embarked on two familiarization visits to the school. The first one was to enable me establish some rapport with the, the, the teachers and then the students. So through that, I was able to um, have some orientation for them on these two uh, theories or um, methods of teaching that I wanted to you know, explore in their school. So to grant them some orientation on it, what is the entails and what we are supposed to do, uh, pre prepare them and upskill these educators on how um, we're going to use this new, um, this new methods or strategy in teaching. That I must emphasize here that I didn't go do the teaching. I rather empower them as in the teachers and the students for, for, for one major reason, the fact that um, it will be quite observe for just, you know, for students to just see an alien come and I mean, be teaching them and all. Moreover, I wasn't going to stay there for long. You know, I was just coming in. So I empowered the teachers, you know, um, on how these things work and the things we, um, we need to put in place. So they were taken through that. Now in the teaching phase. So I used to um, visiting times to do this, orientation, preparation, and then upskilling the educators and the learners on how to use technology. Now, here's the case over there. Um, technology is a problem. There's no internet in the school. Um, 
and even the computers that are there um, less than 50 and most of the students too are not in the boarding house they they, they practice the mixed um, boarding system some are day students they come from their homes and then a chunk of them are kept um, at the boarding house so then um, if you are going to go full-time technology is it going to work no even um, internet should it should there be computers there's no you know the reception there is something else so there, there needed to be some improvisation we're just going to touch on that very soon so the teaching phase so when i had done this orientation for them then came the teaching phase two different methods was methods were used as i said earlier um the ist and then fcis now i was going to just compare this new strategy the two teaching style, which is going to be merged in one classroom, you know, one teaching session, as against the, the normal and the usual ones that students were used to, or that was being practiced in that school. So at the teaching phase, we are going to see two different methods, the traditional teaching method. And whenever I use this, I'm referring to what used to exist there. I mean, most of the time, what they do is almost close to full lecture method. The teacher comes and delivers and open the books and all that, you know, with little or no participation from the students. That's the, the traditional teaching. So I wanted to just break these this genes with these new ones. Good. So the poems I selected were Binzi Poplet by GM Hopkins and then Cage Bed by Maya Angelou. So I used um, one week, you know, or I let me use we, the we here, myself and the teachers. So I'll go the day we'll be doing, I'll just be there you know, observing all, yes. So we used one week in learning these uh, new strategy. So what, how, how did we go about the, 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 the technology as I mentioned earlier, in as much as there wasn't, you know, enough computers, internet and all that. So we went about it this way. Some had phones, especially the students because the borders we're not allowed to use phones on campus. However, the borders, because of the computer lab that they had, the computer laboratory, um, I was able to get some pictures um, to just put on their um, la um, laboratory computers, I mean, and then schedule times with them. So, I mean, I'm talking about the borders here. They come have a look at them, and then um, we, we discussed briefly, but before then, I would give it to them in class. Should I use we? We, good. We, we give it to them in class that they should go and explore. So then this time after school, we will meet again and, you know, have a brief discussion on them as a way of engaging them even way after the normal or official classroom hours. For the day students, they were put in groups. And then those with phones were giving some of these pictures um, to go look as well as compare them, thankful enough, these um, poems had similar features, although they, they are non-African poems. I should, I should add that, they are non-African poetry. So I wanted to see how they are able to just cope with these kind of settings that are brought to them in their poems and how they are able to learn and understand and then write something meaningful. So I selected some words in there to, they can go and explore. And then as we're moving on, I'll be mentioning some of the, um, the ways that were given in there. So they go explore. The first one had something to do with trees, being the poplars, the um, poplars are trees. So then over there, there were so, so many trees that they should just go observe and should there be some environmental degradation or these trees cut down, what are the effects? So some words in there in the poem that could depict this picture were selected that they should go explore. What is the meaning? How many, you know, um, what are the different situations that these words could be used? And these were the things we we're asking them to go and do. So in a way of preparing them for the next, you know, um, um, the full class for that matter. So that's how the, the two were used, you know, for the, po for the poems. And they were, the, the, the teachers were encouraged that they should try as much as possible to link it to what they already know, the environment they are in. Now came the revision and testing time. So after these things were done and were assessed, um, were done, good. We were briefly assessed on that day later, uh, a week after um, 
a revision and testing um, time or session was arranged and then they were tested. And then when we're done, we also now moved on to how to, um, to be sure of what we've done, whether it has had some impact. So we answered some questionnaires and then the findings are what we're going to have a look at. So two questionnaires were given. That is one that has something to do with the, the, the normal teaching style that they were used to, which I said is, is closer to almost the, the lecture method as against the merged ones, um, the flip and then the interactive schema theory. And this is what the, the nature of the, the, the questionnaire, how it was. So this for two, I mean, um, um, those four, the, the normal teaching style that they are used to, and then the same thing too was applied for the, the merging of the FCIS and then IST. So some of the questions are there. Now, when it was analyzed, um, it was found out that most of the, 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 the students were of the view that this kind of strategy, the new one, helped a bit. The very first one was a teacher-centered one, the one that they were used to. Um, out of um, the a number of 400 students, um, about 247, okay, went for the teacher-centered one, went in for the uh, strongly agree. And then about 165 went to strongly disagree. That's how come the, 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 the level of the graph is almost the same. But when you take the second one, the first one has something to do with strongly agree. The fact that um, it helped them, they so un understood whatever was given. Because if you check the nature of the questions here, they strongly agree. Students are pre-informed of the next topic. And they said, they, so you can see that all these questions tallied with how they were able to appreciate the poem so well and so enhance their performance at the tail end of it. So that is how it went. So they, their verdict was that the combination of the schema theory and the, the flip classroom um, instructional strategy is one that helped them a lot because it, it allowed them to explore on, in the environment and they were able to come through with very good responses. Now findings and discussions. The traditional method does not encourage critical, critical thinking the level of boredom is very, very high because they are not triggered to be thinking. It's one month delivery, teacher coming to port, the reservoir of knowledge, okay? Learning arguably halts as soon as lesson ends in class. And then again, it does not, it doesn't put teachers to do adequate advanced preparation per their findings. I mean, the, um, the responses they gave, all these questions were in there because of time. If I have enough time, maybe go through the question, the questionnaire. So all these things were taken from that. And then we also have, um, it doesn't push that FCIs promote self-discovery and relational learning as against the teacher-centered ones. Conclusions and recommendations. The FCIs should be encouraged in English as foreign or second language classes to enable students acquire and build upon their vocabulary in new, um, in, um, new language learnings as in English. Now, Teachers must be resourceful in teaching English. A major solution to this is FCIs. You must try to have a number of um, approaches to the teaching of one concept. Students must be engaged at home to further reinforce what is learned at school. And then eclectic teaching must be deployed in language teaching. Some references, I'm done, thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Philip, for the informative. Talk. Please, please, a point of courage. I'm here to be, a, I am just a master's degree holder. I've not had my um, PhD yet. Thank uh, you. Very much. If you <laughs> have a question to Mr. Philip, would you please write it in the Q&A box so we can address your questions to Mr. Philip? Okay. Uh, for now, Mr. Philip, I would like to ask you, what is your further recommendation for further, what's your recommendation for further studies? For further good, and that's what I said that um, I recommend that um, teachers must be that resourceful in their teaching, as in not resorting to the usage of one particular strategy in teaching. You must blend, try as much as possible to blend more than one. In as much as most of the time, this one is not backed by research though, but I know that most of the time, if one style of teaching is used, it might benefit a chunk 
of the students, but not all of them. So then um, to make the class that lively, you know, um, it's a recommendation that uh, teachers of second languages must try to blend different methodologies in delivering the concept. Thank you. Right. Please, uh, any other question? What are the courses that you are teaching in the college and the number of the students that you have in your university? Oh, okay, you now want to narrow it down to where I am now, where I teach, right? Sorry? You want, you're asking about where I'm working now, where I work, where I teach? In Ghana. In Ghana, oh, okay. The, the population. The ministry of, uh, yeah, yeah, the population, yeah. Oh, okay. So um, this is a, a science-related um, university. It's not in the arts. This is a science by. So we're not that much. Um, I think we are, we are around 2,000 thereabouts. 2,000 plus, yes. The whole um, continuing students. Because we deal in the mining and then allied um, sciences. So, mm. However, they are, all of them are made to uh, go through the, the, the communication class to enhance the way they write and the way they, they, they do their deliveries. Uh, Mr. Philip, there is Ms. Suzanne. Uh, she is asking if you present the list of the references. And would you please write your email address in the chat box because she okay. has something for you. So okay. she can send it to you via email. All right. So I will just put it in my email. All right. And can you present the list of references? OK. You have I, on slide number 20? There are more, just that by virtue of the slide, I just selected a few. Okay. Yes. So I'm putting my email there for now. Please, any other question? Okay. I think this is all the question. Thank you okay. so much, Mr. Fab. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, now we will have. Um, we will be back actually at 1.15 uh, KSA time and 9.45 GMT with the poster session. Now we will close the session. Then we will be back at 1.15 KSA time, 9.45 GMT with the poster session. Thank you all and see you.